I want to welcome you to the Prairie Plains Church of Christ study for Sunday evening, May the 8th of 2022. We are presently studying the book of Jude. Our text is taken from Jude verse 3 and verse 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the interesting things about this letter that was written by Jude is that the book that we have is not the book that he had originally intended to write. If you notice verse 3, he intended to write about the common salvation that they possessed as children of God, disciples of Jesus Christ, as Christians. But he said it was needful for him to write another letter, a different letter, so that they could contend for the faith. And the reason they needed to contend for the faith is that the faith was being attacked by false teachers, as we see in verse 3 and verse 4. A couple of weeks ago, we noticed the possession of great blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. As we look at the book of Jude, there are some things that he mentions about a common salvation, even though he didn't write about the common salvation we have. There are some things that we can apply to our lives. We belong to a group of people that's been called, sanctified, and preserved. They're kept by God. We are passive in these three areas. It is what God has done. It is God that's called us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we answer that call, by being obedient under that call. He is the one that sanctifies us, that sets us apart from all other people, all other people in the world. And he keeps us, he preserves us in Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace, not grace alone. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that we're saved by grace alone. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8, a very familiar verse, for we're saved by grace through faith. Out of all the people in the world, one of the greatest blessings that we have is that we can call Jesus Master and Lord. No one else can. We are the ones that are being saved through the call. We're the ones preserved. We're the ones sanctified. We're the ones who are saved by grace. We're the ones who claim Jesus as Lord. We are obedient unto him as our master. And then one day we'll be ushered into God's presence and into the presence of Jesus Christ. What wonderful, wonderful blessings we possess. But also in Jude 3, we find something else about our common salvation that is defined by the faith that we noticed last week. It is singular. There's only one faith, as we see in Ephesians chapter 4, and it was once delivered. Once and for all, unto whom the saints. That means that there is no other faith, there is no other body of doctrine, there is no other revelation that's been given by God. In fact, Second Peter chapter one verse three, God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? Not by men, but by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that searched the mind of God and revealed it unto the apostles. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 13. Why has it been delivered unto us? So that we can be saved by it, yes, but so that we can proclaim it. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, Mark 16. But Jude brings out that we can also defend it. That we can make sure that it is defended in this world that we live in. Today, 
What I want us to focus on is that our salvation can be lost if we follow false teachers. What is the intent of false teachers? Well, look with me, Luke chapter 11, verse 52. Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. Look at what he says. He's saying to these religious leaders of the day, these lawyers, these scribes, the people who knew better, they would not even enter in the kingdom, but yet those that were wanting to enter into the kingdom, they were hindering, they were trying to prevent from entering in. How did they do all this? Taking away the key of knowledge, taking away the truth from the people. Matthew 23, verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. It says the same thing as Luke chapter 11, verse 52. 52. They shut up the kingdom of heaven, taking away the knowledge from the people. They would not go into the kingdom themselves, and they were trying to prevent others from going in. Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. They will go to extreme to try to make someone a proselyte. But it's not to make him a follower of Jesus. Not to make him a disciple of Jesus. It says you make him twofold more than child of hell than yourselves. So as we look at the intent of a false teacher, do they have our best interest at heart? Absolutely not, because look at what they do. They hinder those entering the kingdom of heaven. They shut up the kingdom of heaven to others. They suffer, they don't allow, they prevent others from entering into the kingdom of heaven. And they make others two times more child of hell than themselves. A false teacher cares nothing about me. A false teacher cares nothing about you. All they care about is their agenda, their goals, and their ambitions. They do not care about our souls one little bit. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. Does a ravening wolf care anything about us? Absolutely not. And in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. They do not care about us. How do these false teachers enter in among God's flock? How do they work? How do they get there? Well, in Matthew 7, verse 15, that we've already looked at, Jesus said they come in as in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Why mention wolves disguised as sheep? Because it is their nature to devour the prey. Wolves to devour their sheep. That is a false prophet's intent, a false teacher's intent. He doesn't appear the way that he is until it is too late. Secondly, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, they try to portray themselves as a minister of righteousness, as we're saying 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Thirdly, they creep in unawares. In Jude 4, he says, for there are certain men crept in unawares. Crept in means 
to settle in alongside, that is, lodge, stealthily. Stealthily means silently, sneakily, cautiously, craftily, secretly. So here they are. They come in very secretly, very craftily, very silently, sneaking in very cautiously to sit alongside of all those that are trying to live Christian lives. And it also means to steal in. Are you beginning to see the devilish schemes of false teachers? You begin to see their character, what they're trying to accomplish, and how they care nothing about us. There is something about the manner of expression that indicates these false teachers, these apostates, have slipped in with the intention to deceive. This is not a brother who has made a mistake in his study and is teaching something by mistake that is wrong. It is not talking about a brother who studies, prepares, and prepares, and teaches a class or preaches and says something wrong accidentally because it's never his intent to lead away. He's not a ravenous wolf trying to devour his brother. He's trying to help them to get to heaven. He's not trying to close up the keys. Yes, teaching error will close the kingdom up to others. However, when he's approached with the truth, he'll always repent and always will change his mind because of what the word of God states. This false teacher that Jesus, Paul, Peter, and Jude mention intends to lead the brother to make a mistake, to commit a sin, to come up with the wrong conclusions about specific things, specific subjects found in the Bible. These are like the false brethren in the Galatian church who, unawares brought in, came privily to spy out liberty, freedom that they possess, Galatians 2.4. In Ephesians 4.14, it's by the practice of cunning craftiness and sly deception of men they lie in wait to deceive. So we can see the difference in heart, the difference in attitude between one who is a false teacher, a false prophet, who intends to be, who intends to lead people away. And there are those who practice truth and they come up maybe with a wrong conclusion about something specifically and they will repent of it. And there is a difference. These false teachers didn't care really, didn't care about the truth. They had their own minds made up. They had their own agenda. These false teachers were turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now see the difference here between two people. The word turning means to transpose two things, one of which is put in place of the other. It means to transfer, to change, to fall away or desert from one person or thing to another. Lasciviousness means no restraints or boundaries. One who does what his sudden emotions, his feelings tell him to do, unbridled lust, shamelessness. So the doctrine of making Christian freedom and the grace of God as an excuse for ungodly living is not anything new in our day and time either. They practiced it then. They practiced it before then. It makes you think of Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and verse 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace more bound? Can we just sin and sin and sin and sin more? So we can obtain more and more grace. He says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Without a doubt. They engaged in that which was openly shameful, that was lewd. There are those today who pervert the grace of God to justify their lifestyle that is contrary to the will of God. Do you think that they might have been saying, God is too kind, too loving to condemn us? He's too loving, too kind, too full of mercy to send people to hell. 
Yes. And there's that people today that have that type of a thought in their hearts and in their minds. Brethren, we can't continue to sin so that grace may abound because we've died to sin. We crucified ourselves. Verse 3 and verse 4 of Romans 6. When we've been baptized, we've been baptized into his death. We've been buried with him in baptism. What for? So that we could be raised up to walk in a new life and a new relationship with Jesus Christ. There are those today who pervert the grace of God to justify their lifestyle that is contrary to the will of God. Do you think they might have been saying, God is too kind to condemn us to hell? Absolutely. If grace sets us free to do as we please, we can choose whether or not we're going to obey God in Christ. So they denied the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. The emphasis seems to be placed on the term Lord associated with God and Jesus. Lord means master, supreme in authority. Basically, they were proclaiming, I'll take Christ, I'll take God, but I'll take them on my terms. He will not be Lord of my life. I'm going to deliberately follow the flesh so that grace can abound. We may not deny Jesus and God with our mouths, but I'm afraid that so many of us do by the way that we live. We must not forget, as a child of God, we belong to our Lord to fill his desires and not ours. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says that God purchased the church with his blood. Who's the church? We are. We're added to the church when we're saved. Acts 2, verse 47. Those that were being saved were repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2, 38, for the forgiveness of their sins. And when they did, they were added to the church. We're the church. The church is a blood-bought institution. If we've been purchased, we don't belong to ourselves. As you see in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, we're not of our own, but we are God's. What do we have a tendency to do? We have a tendency to forget. So we have a tendency to forget what others have done for us. We have a tendency to forget what God has done for us. And so one of the purposes of Scripture is to help us not to forget. And that's what Peter is putting us in remembrance in epistles that he wrote. Jude puts us in remembrance of the things that he wrote also. He wants us to know those things because he needs to write about these things because people were falling away. They were losing their salvation. They were following false teachers. One of the purposes of Scripture is to help us not to forget. In 2 Peter 3, 1, Peter says the purpose he was writing was to stir up their minds through their remembrance. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, Paul instructs Timothy to put them in remembrance. And we see the same thing in Jude, verse 15 and verse 17. This is what Jude is doing in our text. Memory is a blessing. Without memory, there can be no growth, no spiritual, nor scholastic growth. Without memory, the conscience would be dead and man's will would have no purpose. A good memory we should strive for, build up, and treasure, for it is a blessing. Jude here asked his readers to remember important events and lessons from the Old Testament. These events will furnish evidence as to the natural result of these apostate teachers, the teachings that they teach others, and as to the end of the apostate themselves. In essence, 
Judah saying, I'm not telling you anything new. I'm recalling this to your memory. Remember the children of Israel, first of all, in the wilderness, he says in verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Remember how God delivered you out of the hand of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He saved them from the bondage they were under in Egypt. Remember these things. Yet despite their being recipients of wonderful grace, wonderful blessings, we're being recipients as a result of God destroying those who did not believe. Think about that. Think about it. Think about this. This is crucial. God delivered them from Egyptian bondage. He blessed them. He took care of them in the wilderness. Yet when God had them send the spies out and the ten returned with the bad report, they believed the ten rather than Joshua and Caleb, who claimed they could take the land. And the lack of faith this nation had required them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Though God gave them grace, let them out of the land of Egypt. Even when they sinned in the wilderness, God still took care of them and provided for them. However, those over the age of 20 at that time, when the spies were sent out, when they left Egypt, none of them, except for two, Josh and Caleb, entered into the promised land. Now, let me ask you a question from this. Will God destroy those whom he has saved? Absolutely. Paul made this point in writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 12. And also the Hebrew writer made the same point, Hebrews 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 2 and verse 11. The reason is the lack of obedient faith. God destroyed those who did not believe, Jude 5. In Hebrews 3, verse 18 and 18, they could not enter in because of unbelief. That unbelief was disobedience unto God. Are you listening today? The Bible teaches us that we can have assurance of salvation, that we can have security. But at the same time, the Word of God tells us a child of God can develop a heart of unbelief. No wonder we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. With evidence of God's care manifested continually in their lives, they still chose to disbelieve. And they continued. And they continued to insult God by doubting him, by not being obedient to him. And the result is that they were destroyed and they were not allowed to enter in to the land of Canaan. Secondly, Jude brings up the fact that angels have fallen as the result of sin. Jude verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Jude mentions some angels that did not keep their first estate. They left their own habitation. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, so he mentions some angels that did sin. There are questions concerning their sin. We know that one's pride. But one thing is definite, is that they did receive condemnation. The result of their sin is seen in verse 6. Reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Second Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, 
and delivered them into chains of darkness to preserved, preserved into judgment. The point, if God will punish angels, what will he do to false teachers? How much more will he punish false teachers and those who are living in rebellion to his will and those who are following the false teachers rather than following truth? God has prepared a place for fallen angels. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Notice, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice what Jude says about those living ungodly lives in verse 13 of Jude. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Just as God has prepared a place for the angels who sinned, he has a place prepared for those who are false teachers. And from what we read from scripture, it's the same place that he prepared for the devil and his angels. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with what? Fire and brimstone. And he says that is the second death. The third example that God will judge and punish false teachers who will punish the ungodly is seen in those who are disobedient unto him in Sodom and Gomorrah as they were. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Why is this terrible judgment? Jude says, in a similar manner to these. To whom? The angels who sinned. Notice what he says they had done. They had given themselves over to fornication, sexual immorality. One translation says, given themselves over means, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, one reference said, giving themselves over means out and out abandonment giving of one's self utterly saturated with sin, excessive indulgence. They went after strange flesh, all kinds of sexual sins. They're stepping outside the boundaries that God had set forth for the pleasure of intimacy between a man and his wife. The sin was very grievous. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, it's, no, it's not unlike today, is it? People practicing sodomy, lesbianism, bestiality, adultery. They're going after all kinds of strange flesh outside the boundaries that God has set. They're practicing all kinds of sexual sins and they claim that is the right thing to do. We haven't read the Bible. We're ripping words right out of the Bible that God put there. Both Peter and Jude make the point that Sodom and Gomorrah are examples for us to learn from. Peter says an example to those who would live ungodly lives. In Jude 7, set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. We've got great blessings as the result of being in Jesus Christ. And there are no blessings, spiritual blessings outside of Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3 and following. We are to contend for the faith that's been once and delivered. There's no need for any other further revelation. We've received everything that we need for life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Salvation can be lost if we follow false teachers. And we can look at examples in the Old Testament. We need to remember the past, what has happened to some, as Jude mentions. I hope this shows the importance 
of us to be students of God's word. Continue to learn every day so that we can be drawn closer unto God to have our faith increased, to be more mature, to be strengthened so that we can help others find this narrow road that leads unto life, that leads to the throne of God, to heaven itself. Let's grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I want to thank you for allowing me to share this lesson with you today from the Word of God. I hope you have a wonderful week.